Uh, welcome back to the next session on uh, Cornerstone Ideas in Material Science and Engineering. Uh, so this is uh, the set of terms that I showed teachers who are viewing this uh, module last time. I hope you recall some of these terms. It will be helpful for you to recall these things. And uh, over and above that, last time I showed you what scaffolding means. So scaffolding essentially means building a framework around which students can organize information. Uh, instead of just giving information, it is very important for us to organize it, provide a framework uh, around which students would be able to uh, put complex information and make sense of what they are studying and also contextualize. So it is just as important for contextualization of information. Today, uh, we will also discuss something about minute paper. Uh, this is another important tool that can be used in a participatory classroom exercise. And it can also be a very quick means of achieving feedback, uh, receiving feedback and implementing feedback or also gathering information about uh, uh, some input that might be of technical value to you, that might be relevant from a discussion standpoint during the classroom during the class session itself, okay. So uh, today we will have a few minute paper exercises. So coming back to the content part. So in the last class, uh, students independently came up with a description of the stress strain uh, curve and the features of the stress strain curve. Uh, they independently uh, understood what the linear region was, the yield point was. I had to explicitly tell them about the 0.2% offset yield strength and then I talk about the strain hardening region, the necking region and the rupture. But by and large in a very scaffolded manner they arrived at uh, these concepts uh, quite successfully and uh, they were also able to envision these things. For example, when they were told in the, uh, to come up with the differences between brittle uh, material versus ductile material as far as stress strain curve goes, they were able to come up with it by looking at some data that was provided to them. Uh, in the discussion uh, that uh, revolved around classification of materials, all right. So today uh, we will go beyond mechanical properties and we will discuss other properties associated with, with materials including magnetic properties, thermal properties, optical properties and so on. So there are some definitions that are provided here. So this is some write up I have made about thermal properties, okay. So, can you spend some time reading what each of these terms mean? I am going to highlight some terms which are, I believe, key to understanding those definitions. So, spend just two minutes glancing through what is there currently on the board. And then after that I will ask you to discuss a few things. So also recall, when have you heard these words before? Specific heat capacity, CVCP, right? You have heard of this somewhere in your high school or so, all right? Yeah, uh, it is constant pressure. Yeah, thank you for correcting me. You remember your 12 standard lessons very well. Correct, that's correct. Uh, so why don't you read and I'm going to ask you a few questions that will require you to think about these concepts, use these concepts, okay. Now that you have read, you discuss, what you do is, let us say in this particular table, 
you say I will discuss two words, I will discuss two words, I will discuss two words. Here you can say I will discuss three words and three words, okay? And take two to three minutes and choose your own words and explain it to others, okay? And uh, when you choose to explain, you are welcome to use your gadgets and give some examples. Say CV value for iron is so and so, CV value for sodium is so and so, CV value for calcium oxide is so and so. You are welcome to pull out the data, okay, by using internet and tell it to others. So you, you can use those numbers to illustrate to your benchmates, okay, yeah, please. Choose your words. So look at some numbers associated so that it becomes a little bit more reasonable for you. Also look at the units associated. So write down the units, write down the numbers associated, yeah. So you can choose your words. What words would you like to choose? So let us say you choose the top two you choose the next two, you choose the next two, alright. So l spend one minute looking at some relevant numbers, SI units, okay, and uh, be ready to discuss it with one another, alright. You also, you choose your words, choose your words, look at the SI units and the relevant numbers. Hmm? So are you writing down numbers and units? Please choose SI units. For example, between calorie and joule, what will you choose? Joule. Between degree Celsius and Kelvin, what would you choose? Kelvin. Kilometers and meters? Meters. Okay. Meter is what I would prefer. Okay. So please start discussing with one another and help me fill this table. So this table looks like this. I am looking for a property CVCP, the units, values. You can give some values for a typical ceramic, metal and polymer. Similarly delta HF, units, typical values for these three classes of materials. Alright? You understand? Yes. You understand? Yes. So that table I would like you to help me fill up. Hmm? 
So choose your own two parameters, develop the numbers for that, all right, and then you share it with others so that they fill their table. Got it? You you got it? You understood? So you just choose your own two parameters. Let us say for that you fill this entries in the table. You choose your own parameters. You choose your own parameters. You understood? Did you choose your parameters? Yeah, good. And you help him fill the blanks for those parameters. You help him for the ones that you are responsible for. Okay. Are you able to get your units and values, typical values? So remember, it should be in joules per kilogram per Kelvin. You can also choose to put, uh, let us say, CV in joules per mole per Kelvin. Okay. But let everybody stick to joules per kilogram Kelvin to begin with, as far as CV is concerned. Okay. You got it. Can I start having values now? First of all, discuss with one another, fill your tables up. All right. So you have the numbers for CV. CV and CP. CP, you are getting very good. And in what unit? I'm specific Latin. Uh, kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. That is fine. Fine, fine. Very good. Latin. Very good. What, uh, and what about you? What are the values you are getting? Thermal expansion coefficient and thermal conductivity. Very good. And you are doing it for solids also, no? Yeah, all gases. No, no. You need to get some solid values also. That is very important. See, because I am asking for ceramic, metal and polymer. Okay. Ceramic, metal and polymer. You are able to get values for your requirement? Okay. So... Are you getting CV values for a ceramic, metal and a polymer? Okay, good. And what about you? What values are you getting, Abhishek? Origit, huh? Okay, emissivity values, very good. You don't have to do a very exhaustive search. Huh? I am just looking for one metal, one ceramic, one polymer. That's all. No exhaustive search required. Because the numbers you get would be actually representative of that materials class. All right. So let us say for ceramic, you can choose alumina. For polymer, you can choose polyacetylene or PVC, whatever. Just one thing that is very easily available. For metal, you can choose iron if you want. All right. Yes. Okay, so let me start having some numbers. Very quickly you discuss, now you don't have, no longer have time to look into your cell phones. Please keep your cell phones aside and show one another the numbers you have. Fill your tables and let me start filling it here in less than a minute. So just look at one another's numbers please. See, you should have a table like this drawn in your sheet. Okay. Yeah. So, CVCP units. Does do you want to say the units? D okay. You are for another parameter. Do you want to say the units? Kilojoule. Ah. Kilojoule. Into Kelvin. If it is molar specific heat, then it will be kilojoule per mole 
per Kelvin. All right. So, what are the typical values for, let us say, ceramic from that table? Huh? For a ceramic, what is the ceramic for which you are giving me the value for CV or CP? Do you have the value with you? Just tell me the name. Alumina? 6.3. No, that cannot be the right. I am talking about CV, CP. So it has to be in kilojoule per kilogram per Kelvin. CV values. You should be getting it quickly. Yeah, right. Ah, that's okay. So tell me the ceramic value. Ah, but what is the unit? That is joule kilogram. Ah, that's right. So what is the value? So you convert the joules to kilojoules because I have written there kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. How much? One point? Zero nine kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. This is for ceramic. That's about right. A few, one to a few kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin is reasonable. What about for a metal? How much? 24.5 per? So, look at the difference. It's kilogram per kilojoule per kilogram Kelvin. And in your case, the ceramic that you said was what? So, let us say quartz. Let us say if there is quartz or alumina. So, that is 0 0.85. 0 0.85. So, 0 0.85 to 1 metal is very high. Interesting, isn't it? So, this is an important data. Okay, over and above that, for the, for the polymer, let us look at the number. This is very important. I am going to come back to this in a while. Yes, polymer. Uh -huh. In joules per 230? Per kilogram Kelvin? Can I have one more data? That's about what I expect. That's about right. So, ceramics and polymers would be very similar. That's what I expect. So, this will also be around 1 kilojoule per kilogram Kelvin. So, which one has the highest specific heat capacity? Metal. What does that mean? If I wanted to actually take a metal sample and a ceramic sample and I want to increase the temperature of this by 1 degree and I increase the temperature of this by 1 degree, which one is going to be harder? Which one requires more energy? Metal. Increasing the temperature of metal tends to be a little harder than increasing the temperature of either ceramics or polymers. Very good. That makes a lot of sense. By the way, it has an important implication on how materials also respond to thermal shocks. And we'll come to that maybe in a case study that we'll have in this class in a while, okay? But this is an important data to keep in mind, all right? Okay, next, delta HF. You choose, let us say, melting, melt transformation. So melting of ceramic, melting of metal, and melting of a polymer. And let us look at the delta HF, the heat of transformation, delta HT, the heat of transformation associated with it. Delta H, uh, from, those, from your high school chemistry, I want you to remember it is enthalpy change. Okay? It is enthalpy change that we are talking about. So, we are talking about an enthalpy of transformation. All right. So, look at one ceramic one metal, one polymer and the delta HF associated with it. So, you can do for metal, you can do for ceramic, you can do for polymer. You can do for ceramic, metal, polymer. So, that very quickly you come up and you share the data with one another.
yes some numbers yeah first of all what is the unit kilojoules per kilogram very good all right number for ceramic uh -huh. okay. 398 kilojoules per kilogram all right for a ceramic this is melting no the de the delta h of fusion is same as melting so i am looking at melting as an example melting is also called fusion all right yes ceramic choose any ceramic let us say alumina the enthalpy of melting is 29.6 kilojoule per mole ah it is kilojoule per mole since this is in kilojoule per kelvin you will have to give me in kilojoules per uh, kg sorry kilojoules per kg so is it possible to convert kilogram per sorry kilojoule per kilogram to kilojoule per mole yes very straightforward right you need to know the gram molecular mass of the ceramic yeah so please uh, yes do you have a number for uh, ceramic delta hf uh, sorry delta h fusion that is delta h in this particular case that is the transformation that we are looking for yes no no it will be there or let us say let us work with his number his number is how much for alumina how much is it navin delta hf for alumina 398 kilojoule per kilogram kelvin all right but then you had another number for so this 398 was for a metal i am asking for a ceramic so what is the value you had uh, navin can you tell me 29.6 ah okay kilojoule per mole kelvin but what is the compound it is not alumina so what is cerium titanate cerium c ti2o6 c ti2o6 t2i ti2 ti2o6 okay so how will i go from kilojoules per mole kelvin to kilojoules per kilogram kelvin Huh? Ah, sir, correct. That's right. Kilojoules per mole. That's correct. So, how will I go from kilojoules per mole to kilojoules per kilojoules per mole to kilojoules per kilogram? I have to multiply it by the number of moles per kilogram. Correct. So, how will I find out the gram molecular mass of CeTi2O6? I have to take the atomic mass of cerium plus twice the atomic mass of titanium. Plus six times the atomic mass of oxygen, right? So let me write that down. So I am talking about gram atomic mass of cerium, plus two times the gram atomic mass of titanium, plus six times the gram atomic mass of oxygen. Can you tell me what that number is? Write down the gram atomic mass. Cerium is how much? Well, you have it in your fingertips. What is the gram atomic mass of cerium? Fifty-eight grams. Okay, plus twice the gram atomic mass of titanium. Are you sure this number is correct? Fifty-eight. This is an AMU. That's yeah. That's grams per mole. Okay. Ah, uh, uh, plus six times the gram atomic mass of oxygen. How much is that? Sixteen. How much is this? Fifty-eight plus forty-four. So, so how many moles are there in one kilogram? Thousand divided by one ninety-eight. So that's roughly five. Correct. So you have five moles. So this multiplied by five. So roughly one fifty kilojoules. Per kilogram, one fifty kilojoules per kilogram. What about for a polymer? Two ninety three. 
किलो जाउल्स पर ऑल राइट सो वॉट डज दिस टेल यू दिस वन हाउ मच इज इट फॉर विच मेटल वॉज दिस नो नो फॉर दिस वन हैज टू बी मच लेसर इट के this has to be much lesser even this one is actually a, seems like an underestimate to me are you sure about the data are you sure about this data so for cerium titanate you told me that the delta hf is 29.6 kJ per mole is that reasonable that doesn't seem reasonable to me okay so but this is correct for the metal can you tell me what metal this was aluminum, aluminum. that's about right so i expect delta h of fusion this is correct this and this i am still not confident whether we are dealing with the right numbers can you look at another example let us say delta h of of let's say silica quartz delta h of fusion of silica silica is si02 yeah silica is si02 what is the enthalpy of fusion of okay sodium chloride that's also a ceramic how much per mole now you can that is minus 412 kilojoules per mole now convert that into is that delta H. yeah it's very very high yes that's about what i was guessing yes so sodium chloride is minus 412 that means it is is it an exothermic process or endothermic process it depends upon what you are doing whether you are cooling or heating right so if you are going to generate the melt then the delta h will be positive if on the other hand you go from the fused product to the solid the delta h will be negative very good so you understand delta h very well now this numbers are not reasonable i i want you to find out the errors and give me the reasonable number how much 25 that is joules per gram so you convert that so that will be 285 kilo joules per kilogram that's so that's about reasonable so polyethylene right so this is in the same ballpark so this seems to be true for a large number of uh, polymers silicon or silica silica is sio2 sio2 is silica silicon is si and this is not a metal it's a metalloid this one is a ceramic so i am asking you to look for ceramic metal and polymer how can yeah please look at the number tell me soon yes can you discuss with one another what number do you have that seems right okay so for polyethylene what we have gotten is right so i have two ticks on the board now i want one more tick so i am not sure if the ceramic value you have given is correct yes so all of you now know how to evaluate the gram molecular mass right so wherever there is kilo joule per mole per kelvin uh, kilo joule per mole you can convert into kilo joule per kilogram very easily all right and give me the value in kilo joule per kilogram just look for any ceramic let us say silica sio2 delta h of fusion yes 
Ah, correct. Very good. That is right. That's very reasonable. Yes. Correct. So it's actually ten times higher. <laughs> so, so this is let us say how much was it for silica? Sodium chloride. It is how much? Eight nine five six. So sodium chloride is actually a highly ionic ceramic, highly ionic ceramic, and you will find this. So from this, generally you can be, generally, uh, this is the trend that you expect. So ceramic would have a much higher delta H F, where F is fusion, followed by metal, followed by polymer. This is more or less what you can expect. This is what uh, what you anticipate. And the delta H F of a ceramic is about ten times higher than that of a metal. Okay. So this is the this is a reasonable trend. The next one is thermal conductivity. You already have the numbers, and you already have it in the classification table. I think that I have given you. So, yes. What is the unit first of all? Huh? Meter Kelvin. Okay. For a ceramic, what is the value? Point seven two. Point seven two watt per meter Kelvin. That sounds right. Yes. And for copper, three ninety. Correct. Point two. So polymers tend to be per meter Kelvin, right? So polymers tend to be the poorest thermal conductors, followed by ceramics, followed by metals. Metals are actually champion thermal conductors, but there are some ceramics that are very good thermal conductors that have thermal conductivity about ten times higher than this. All right. Some nitrides, for instance, actually have fairly high thermal conductivities, but it will never be much, much more than this. It can go from 0.5 to let us say maximum of 5 to 10 uh, watt per meter Kelvin. Here it will be always very high. It will be a few hundred watt per meter Kelvin. This will always be a fractional value in terms of watt per meter Kelvin. All right. Next is thermal expansion coefficient. First of all, what would be the unit? Per degree, per degree Kelvin or per degree Celsius. All right. Per degree Celsius. Now that is the same. Yeah. Be 24 into 10 to the power of minus 6 per Kelvin for polymers. For polymers, 145 into 10 to the power of minus 6. Minus 6 per Kelvin. So, which one is obviously expanding much more? Polymers. So, polymers actually can also have, in some cases, negative thermal expansion coefficient where there can be shrinkages because there can be a lot of open volume, void volume in a polymer. But here it is an example of a polymer that is actually forming a relatively continuous network and there is definitely a thermal expansion coefficient associated with it. Yes, anything else? And for ceramics, 9 into 10 power minus 6. 9 into? 10 power minus 10 to the power of minus 6. Perfect. So, all right. So, by looking at this, which one is expanding the most? Perfect. Polymers, no question about that. And which one expands the least? That is actually right. But however, let me say that I have one ceramic material. All right. So I have one ceramic material. And I have another ceramic material. I am basically going to stick it together. I am going to stick it together. If this has some alpha, this has some alpha, and this has another alpha, what do you expect will happen if I heat and cool it? This will expand differently when compared to this. So at room temperature, let us say that they are perfectly at the same length. But if I heat it, this might elongate more, this will not elongate more. And hence what will happen to the interfaces? It's a, yes, and it's a brittle material. So it can actually end up getting thermal cracks. So this is very common a problem in ceramics. So wherever you have ceramic heterostructures, you can expect thermal shocks, thermal cracks, interfacial thermal cracks and so on. All right. So this tells you a little bit about it. So thermal expansion coefficient, let's say of one material is 9 into 10 to the power of minus 6. Another is 6 into 10 to the power of minus 6. Still when you put it through some thermal cycles, at the interface there can be enormous difference in the strains that each of them have. And as because they are welded essentially to one another, you can expect thermal stresses, interfacial cracks and so on. All right. Metals and for the polymers, they expand a fair, fair bit. 
Now, what will happen if you put a ceramic and a metal together and put it through thermal cycles? The ceramic can actually crack up. You can see that here. So if I have a metal and a ceramic, metal typically doesn't expand much when you actually put it through thermal cycles. This will expand a lot, but the metal would not allow the ceramic to expand, hence the ceramic would crack up. So typically material structures, material heterostructures, the thermal stability has to be ensured by looking into their alpha values. You have to look into the alpha values, you have to look at the compatibility of the alpha values and that is when you choose which material sits beside which. You understand? Okay, emissivity. This is the Stiffens constant. The emissivity. Can you give me the sigma value? Watt per? Yes. That's not the only thing, is it? The unit. Huh? No. Because remember the Stiffens constant is sigma into t power of 4. Okay. Energy radiated per unit area, per unit time. Yes, so it's and this one is joule per second of course, per unit area, Do, is there anything else there? It cannot be just that, because there is t power of 4. So there is Kelvin, power of, just look for the unit, huh? correct to the power of 4, that is correct, now you are right. How do you say, how did you no notice I came up with a unit, because you have energy, per unit time on the left hand side in Stephen's law, okay, and then I have some quantity multiplied by t power of 4, t is in Kelvin, right, so I have Kelvin power of 4, I eventually need a unit associated with sigma, so that the outcome would be watt per meter square, you understand, so remember the Stephen's law, the energy radiated by a body kept at a temperature t per unit area is given by sigma t power of 4. So the unit of this is watt per meter square. If this one has a unit of Kelvin power of 4, this one needs to have a unit such that this Kelvin power of 4 gets removed. So you will have watt per meter square Kelvin. Now tell me, what the sigma value would be for let us say a typical ceramic, okay, a typical metal. Ah, for units, powers, Please tell me, for metal how much is it? Zero point? Zero seven. Yeah. Multiplied by? Are there any powers? No. Okay. Alright. So it is watt per meter square Kelvin power of 4. What about this? What about a ceramic? 0 0.013 watt per meter square Kelvin power of 4 ceramic. So which one radiates more on an average? Metals, not surprising, right? not surprising. You expect metals to be much better radiators on an average. Okay, next. Polymers. That's on the high side. Which polymer is this? Huh? Ah, okay. And the unit is correct? Watt per meter square Kelvin power of 4? Okay. So this one is a little bit of a surprise for me. Can you, one of you basically check? This one and this one is consistent with what I expect. So this might be to do with the fact that it is a special polymer. So look at let us say PVC or whatever. All right. Yes, you are confident of these numbers? So this is a little bit of a surprise and you said this is for PVDF, is it? PTFE. So that is polytetrafluoroethylene. Okay. So that is interesting that it is so radiative, it is so emissive. Good, very good, alright. So now we will have a minute paper exercise. I will tell you what minute paper exercise is. Uh, you all, all of you have uh, some blank sheets of paper. You take a small slit from it 
and write down what you have learned so far over the last 40 minutes. Lessons you have learned over the last 40 minutes. So it can be two or four lessons that you have written and you can pass it on to me. All right. So this is the minute paper exercise wherein you can get immediate feedback from the students. Between two to four things you recall from the last 40 minutes of discussion you have had with one another, you can write it and then you can also read it out for others who are sitting with you. All right. So write it out in just one minute and read it out to one another in one minute. Okay. So I am timing you. It's uh, 5.15 here right now. So by 5.16 you should be done. 5.17 you will read it out to one another. Okay. And feel free to be specific. For example, I learned that the thermal conductivities of metals are the best, followed by ceramics, followed by polymers. I learned that polymers can be quite emissive. All the metals are tend to be the most emissive. All right. Then you can say that thermal expansion coefficients. So what did you learn about thermal expansion coefficients? You will notice that metals actually expand quite a bit, right? When compared to ceramics and certainly when compared to polymers. The enthalpy of fusion of ceramics tends to be the highest. And put some numbers also because that also conveys information. So now it's time for you to discuss with one another. It's 516. So please discuss with one another what you have written. You can take 10 more seconds if you wish. But please discuss what you have learned. Feel free to put some numbers also, that is correct. Feel free to put numbers. You are all capturing things very well. Okay, very good. And I think you also learned how to arrive at units, right? Because we had this discussion on how emissivity becomes. Uh, Watt per meter square per Kelvin power of 4 as far as units is concerned, right? So, and this is not always the case because there are exceptions. We saw PTFE for example, right? So, it is not as, em it is more emissive than metals in fact. So, that is, hmm, yeah. Okay, very good. So you understand what you have learned? So thermal yeah, properties. So the thermal crack the definitions of thermal properties. Thermal cracks could actually happen in ceramic heterostructures. Those are very new ideas, right? And then thermal expansion coefficient, the sequence. For example, metals expand much more than Polymer. ceramics, right? And, and if you have two ceramics that are sitting next to one another having different thermal expansion coefficients, you put it through some thermal cycling, they would start cracking up, right? So you learnt all those things. Yes, very good. 
derivation of units very good thermal cracking variation of several parameters uh, several thermal properties of materials very good and Stefan Boltzmann's constant yes uh, knowing how to interpret values that are available in tables very good and of course uh, looking at values to arrive at trends right because that's also an important activity for somebody who works with experimental data and so on excellent so you're all doing very well you did learn quite a bit huh? so can i have your minute paper so that i can keep it for records yes thank you you don't have to write your name yes yes thank you thank you good all right now i'm going to ask you a question that requires a little bit of thinking so in all of these cases the thermal expansion coefficient was positive isn't it so why do you think it has to be positive number one and what do you think is the origin of thermal expansion coefficient so what do you think is the origin of thermal expansion coefficient okay so no no now you'll have to discuss with one another please discuss with one another and come up with your own ideas for why thermal expansion coefficient is positive and the origin of it all right yes please So, Okay, so do you have some visualizations of what might be happening as far as thermal expansion is concerned? All right. So remember, you are limited in your language as far as the background is concerned, right? So we'll have to draw upon some parallels in order to make sense. And this is a common way of theorizing, model building, and so on. So you have seen something like strain in this particular course, right? So when you say you are heating up a material, it's basically say you are essentially saying that there is a change in length, there is an incremental change in length. And my question is, why would that be the case? Can we think in terms of interatomic distances, atoms that are making up this particular solid? What is happening as far as interatomic distances are concerned? Would it remain constant or is it changing as a function of temperature? That's a hint. Based on that, continue your discussion. All right. So this is the scaffold I'm trying to give. I'm trying to tell you that you can use some language. All right. Let's say the language of interatomic distances. All right. So would the interatomic distance remain constant when I heat it up? Okay. Or would it increase? Would it decrease when I heat it up? Assume that the structure of the material remains the same. That means the atomic arrangements are 
by and large the same relative to one another. But the distance between them, would it remain the same or would it change as a function of temperature? That is the question I am asking. You understand? So, what is your answer? Have you started discussing? How how large would it be? Uh, that, uh, loosely bounded. No, so uh, in a polymer, let us say you have carbon, carbon, carbon backbone. Yeah. What is the carbon carbon distance in a One polymer backbone? That's all. It is comparable to interatomic distance elsewhere also. So what is different? Okay. <laughs> right? Yes. So by giving the thermal energy that will convert to, to the more vibrational energy. Haan. So the material has to somehow accommodate this thermal energy. That's what you are saying. You know, when you are heating up the material, the material has to accommodate this thermal energy. That could result in vibrations of atoms. And if these vibrations are such that the interatomic distance is increasing, then there is an explanation, right? Very good, that is correct. So this alpha is entirely because of the fact that you are giving energy to the solid. This energy to the solid is ultimately transformed into vibrational energy in the solid. And these vibrations essentially change the interatomic distances. The precise mechanics of which you will see in some other section of this particular course. But I wanted you to see for yourself how you can come up with some cause-effect relationships. Okay, So you are absolutely right. It's thermal energy getting converted into vibration energy in solid, which in turn changes the interatomic distances in the solid. All right? Absolutely right. Very good. Now, this is the last question for this session. So, look at the phase diagram. Sorry. Look at the phase diagram of iron given below. What do you think it represents? So, I am going to show you a diagram, it is called the phase diagram. All right? And you will have to tell me what it represents. Okay? So, this is the diagram. So, just like water can be converted into vapor and liquid, iron can be converted into vapor and liquid. And you will find this funny looking symbols, alpha, gamma, delta, iron. Okay? There is pressure on the x-axis, temperature on the y-axis. What do you think this represents? Discuss with one another. Okay. What do you think this represents? And let, us, let me also add one more thing to the question. What if you had only the ability to measure, the ability to measure specific heat capacity or heat exchange, nothing else? Okay. What would happen if you went through this boundary? You, you are in this boundary to begin with. You are in this region to begin with. You go past this boundary. Okay? How would you know that you have indeed crossed the boundary? So these are two questions. What does this graph represent? Number one. Number two. You understand? Number two. If I start from one region. By the way, it is called phase field. If I start from one region and I go to another region. What kind of thermal signatures am I likely to observe? Sir, please discuss with one another. Do you understand the question? Yes. Do you understand this? So what does the graph represent? Step one. The next thing that you should think about is, suppose I go from here to here, what are the thermal signatures that I would observe? Will I will? Very good. Very good. Do you want to go to the board and explain? So you go to the board. You can either use this board or that or that. It's up to you. And explain your response. You can use this. Maybe that's better because that can be captured.
they are all solids you think very good that's correct yes of atoms are changing so you think that will result in some change uh -huh. yes there it's given yes yes again body centered yes so the arrangement of atoms is changing so since the arrangement of atoms is changing you think what will change Ah, very good. So that's right. Because here we notice that the arrangement of atoms makes a difference, right? So clearly, as you're going across those phase boundaries, you would expect a dramatic change in your specific capacity. That is absolutely right. Good job. Very nice. So, uh, if we go, this, I will go other. So, when the pressure is very high, then we can liquidate the form. But pressure is low, but temperature is high, then it will go to the temperature. Right. Right. So at very high pressures, you are able to get a condensed phase, right? Yes. So that's another thing that he's observed. Good. So what he's saying is, these are higher pressures, okay? This high pressure region, this lower pressure, at the same temperature, let me say at this temperature, I'm going to increase the pressure, I can go from vapor to the condensed form, correct? So clearly vapor can be converted into liquid just by applying relevant pressures as given by this particular diagram. So this diagram enables you to tell or enables you to design what pressure temperature you need to operate in so as to get certain phases of this material. For example, if I want vapor, I know the combination of pressure and temperature. If I need to go from vapor to liquid, I know the combinations of pressures and temperatures I need. If I cool it down at a given pressure, I know what phases I expect, correct? And as I cool down, as I go through each of these phase boundaries, I expect a change in the specific capacity of the material because there is a change in the atomic ordering as I go down. And this is precisely right. This is good. This is a very good answer. Yes. That's right. So this is a very interesting point, isn't it? Because you have a vapor, you have vapor, you have solid here, okay? And so at this particular point, of course, you have vapor, this solid form and this solid form. Because this one, if you recall, is a BCC form, FCC form, BCC form. So this FCC is in equilibrium with BCC, is in equilibrium with vapor at this point. At this point, on the other hand, this FCC form, this BCC form and this vapor is in equilibrium. At this point, you will find this vapor, liquid and this BCC form in equilibrium with one another, right? So these are all triple points for all practical purposes because you have three faces that are in equilibrium with one another. So you have three faces in equilibrium with one another. You have three faces in equilibrium with one another at this point. So that is absolutely right. You have three faces corresponding to this point. Corresponding to this boundary, you have two faces in equilibrium with one another. So what did you notice? If there are two faces in equilibrium with one another, you have a line. If you have three faces in equilibrium with one another, you have a point. If you have just one face, you have a two-dimensional region. So the dimensionality reduces as the number of faces in equilibrium increases. All right? This results in a very important rule, and that's called the Gibbs face rule. All right, good. So to summarize, uh, you learned quite a few things, okay, today. Uh, you learned about thermal properties of materials and you learned that thermal properties of materials go into design of structures and heterostructures of materials. You also learned how the thermal properties of ceramics, metals and polymers vary in relationship to one another, how they are positioned how they are rank ordered and you also saw how thermal properties are helpful in analyzing phase behavior of materials. Now there is a very important phase that of uh, phase diagram that of water. So take a look at it. In cold countries it turns out that ice can be gotten rid of by putting some salt. Okay. So ice in general starts melting when you put some salt on it. So ask yourself can that be explained by using phase diagram. You understand? So, vapor pressure is decreased. I do not know. Uh, you will have to think about it. So, think about it. That's a homework problem. Another thing is when you stand on ice, 
people slip okay why do they slip what might be the reason like okay yes yeah. so think about it all right so uh, we will start uh, electrical and magnetic property discussion in the next class one last thing that i want to actually uh, drive home here is the thermal property as given here all right is indicative of the interatomic potentials that is present in the material for example here the delta hf is very large okay here it is not this is made up of uh, uh, ions you know ceramics can have a mixture of ions ionic bond and covalent bond and ionic bond can be very very strong because they are positive and negative charges that are interacting with one another and that's the reason why it's hard to fuse ceramics it's relatively easy to fuse metals it's very very easy to fuse polymers right so the nature of bonding as a consequence plays a very important role in determining the thermal properties of materials so the nature of bonding is critical and eventually you will see that the nature of bonding is also important to determine mechanical properties electrical properties magnetic properties all of the above so bonding is a very crucial uh, principle as far as our uh, material science is concerned and eventually you'll also learn that bonding and structure are not uncorrelated bonding and structure is in fact correlated with one another and uh, that's where we will start off uh going beyond properties so right now i am just motivating you to think about properties that can be measured easily but then you will realize that these properties to rationalize them you have to look at bonding that is present in these materials also okay so with that we will stop and uh, thank you and we will uh, you will see us again shortly thank you